I quickly fell back into the shipboard routine over the next week. To give my days more variety, I had split my daily exercise session into two. I started in the morning with a vigorous and sweaty session on the magic treadmill. In the afternoon, I did a second more meditative yoga or Pilates session. I also had a set time every evening, which I would spend reading. Sometimes this reading session was more of a sip scotch and stare at the fake fireplaces session. I had tried a few games with Naomi, but soon soured on those as the machine was too smart at the skill games, and I could not stand to see her limit herself to give me a chance. I ended up getting hooked on solitaire one night and playing into the early hours of the next morning. Luckily, Naomi was a lenient captain and gave me light duties the next day. We did add a bit of fun to the magic treadmill. Naomi fabricated a set of polarized glasses that allowed me to view the screen images in full three dimensions. The AI then provided me with a full set of faux weapons, which worked very much like the real thing, except that they fired no ammo. I was then able to simulate running, sneaking, stalking, skating, and skiing. The whole gambit, while armed and shooting at various enemies and targets which appeared in the surrounding viewing screens. The screens could track the hits and misses, and the digital foes reacted accordingly. It got real when the AI added an outfit that gave me feedback. A haptic suit, she called it. Now, when I got hit by the enemies, I felt it. My first go with the suit about knocked me on my ass when I got shot. After a bit of cursing and yelling on my part, Naomi dialed down the power and it became much more fun and exciting. I had so much fun that the battle runs and the other games like it became my normal morning vigorous workout. My mood improved so much that Naomi got to work on more simulation games. She promised a full motion seat in a spherical screen bubble, which would shake and roll me around and give me the feeling of driving a tank or an armed dune buggy or even flying an airplane. It sounded like a blast, but it would take a few days as she had to reroute a few items below the floor plates in the Rex room. That work was needed to provide more room for the fun sphere's movement base, as the Rex room lacked the height to install the unit fully above the deck. She had offered to place it in the salon or the forward workroom, but I wanted to keep it out of the salon and hated to get in the way of any repairs or fabrications taking place in the workroom. One morning, I woke up and saw on the wall display that it was May 4th. A lead weight hit me and I slumped back down into bed. It was Abby's birthday. Ever since her accident, the anniversary of this day had hit me hard. I felt tears form in my eyes and knew they were from a combination of missing her, which was normal, and from guilt when I realized how seldom I thought of her these days. I wondered if my subconscious somehow sensed that the death of my child had happened more than nine centuries ago and felt the separation in time. I had slept for all of that, except for a few waking months so the wound should have been as fresh as it had been back when I lived alone in South Dakota but it was muted somehow. For a moment, I suspected it was more of that damn mental tampering by the machine. But when I thought about it, I did not think it was her that had muted my emotions of those memories. I think I just knew that I was now different. I felt different. I was in a new body, in a new time, and doing new things. My subconscious was compartmentalizing the eras I had lived. I rolled over and buried my face in the pillow. I felt like I was betraying the memories of my daughter and my wife. The AI must have realized why I wasn't waking up, as I normally did, because the wall images stayed muted and dim. After 10 minutes, my birth door opened and Omu entered, carrying a tray. I smelled bacon and eggs. I rolled over and sat up. The smell helped get my mind off my sorrows. I saw that she had a carafe of coffee and a small glass of juice on the tray also. Joan, I wish there were a way for me to ease your burden on this day of memory and sadness. I do not and cannot fully understand what you are feeling, but I will make one observation which may help. You are alive and have more life ahead of you. She paused for a moment, letting me digest her words before continuing. This life can be as rich as you wish it to be. You can have joy and companionship again. Although you can never have the family that you lost, you can have a new family. Again, she paused, maybe sensing my doubts. None of your past or your memories of your family need be forgotten or replaced, but they can be joined and shared with new memories, just as strong and rewarding. The black robot then poured me a cup of coffee and set the tray on the bed beside me. As she reached the doorway to leave, she paused. You are a sentient being. You have the power and resources to make your own destiny. 
You must wield this power and set your course forward in the best way possible. Anything less would be a waste. The Obsidian Humanoid Mobile Unit left the room, leaving me with much to think about. Her words and the food shifted the mood of the room. This was reinforced when the AI slowly morphed the images on the full wall screen to show a sunrise shining on a scene of a freshly mowed and immaculately landscaped yard. I saw the perfect gardens in the background and the meadows beyond filled with grazing wildlife. I smiled and began eating. Thank you, Naomi, I get what you're saying. A week later after my morning workout and shower, I was eating a snack of a fresh orange that I had picked from the tree growing in the corner of the salon. Naomi was giving its daily briefing. I learned that tomorrow Nautilus would be passing the Cape of Good Hope. Well, actually, we would be over a hundred nautical miles offshore of the Cape as we were staying far off the continental shelf to leave us plenty of water depth to maneuver. I would love to have gone closer and done a bit of sightseeing, but the risk was just not worth it. Not when the slightest hint that we were here might bring countless fusion bombs dropped from an orbital station. The machine had unlimited resources and no reason to be timid in its response. It could boil the waters with high-powered sonar beams if it wished and damn the whales who would be driven insane. Also, the southern passage around Africa actually had a bit of enemy AI traffic as there were a few vessels moving on the surface. Some were transporting items between various destinations. Others were engaged in biologic work doing surveys of water life. A few more were still doing ocean cleanup as there were dumps off the continental shelves of all the old major population centers. I had learned that the waste served a dual purpose as the reduction machines considered it a valuable feedstock and an easier source of certain scarce elements. Our problem was that these vessels had no problem using active sonar and radar to scout the waters for floating debris or to monitor their own aquatic drones as they sniffed around the ocean floor looking for sources of contamination. This meant we had to go slower and sometimes far out of our way to avoid them. I learned much about how the layers of water affected how far we would be detected from their probes. So our already slow and steady journey was at times even slower. It was two days later before our course turned fully east and even a bit north. We were approaching the Indian Ocean. Naomi and I had looked at the various islands remaining between us and Sri Lanka. We'd agreed that we would stop and do a bit of scouting on the island of Mauritius, which was about 2,200 nautical miles ahead or around nine days of travel. We'd be passing southeast of Madagascar in a bit over six days and the former French island of Reunion a day or two later. The reasons for stopping at Mauritius were twofold. The first was we wanted to work with the monkey and the jackal, our other two biodrones. The second was that I needed another break from the submarine. I know that sailors on subs used to go for months at a time in the past, but try doing it alone and without much surface time. The new swiveling spherical simulator and the magic treadmill helped and were great diversions, but they were no substitution for being outdoors. A few days later, after sunset, we were going to surface Nautilus to allow Naomi to scan the airwaves and satellite signals for new data. When we approached periscope depth, I could feel the motion through Nautilus's hull. There was a storm overhead and a big one. Naomi raised the photonics mast and the view was interrupted by huge waves. We decided to delay the attempt and instead sank back down deep where the running was again smooth. Later, while I was lounging in the salon, Naomi had informed me that she had detected the storm by our listening arrays before we had made the attempt to surface. I was curious, so she showed me the acoustic signatures. I then received a brief lesson on how our sensitive acoustic detectors worked and was impressed. It was entertaining to hear the various whales and other underwater life forms as they chattered about. Friday evening, three days later, the surface conditions were calm enough to allow the boat to surface. I was dressed in a warm outfit because of the cool night air and spray. We were still making five knots, so I went up in the sail instead of the lower landing deck as waves were occasionally sweeping over much of the hull. The skies were solid overcast clouds and there was an occasional light drizzle, so we had no fear of being detected from orbit. Joan, I am detecting a great deal of data transmission and communications between remote units coming from Madagascar to the northwest. I am also detecting some transmissions coming from Reunion Island ahead. Do you have any idea what is going on? I asked. Some of the communications involves various construction projects on the larger island. 
I am unable to synchronize with many of the transmissions as are positioned to too far away and many originate over the local horizon. The heavy cloud cover permits the safe deployment of a high altitude aerial drone. I have set your goggles to protect you from the glare. Stand by. I was about to ask her what she had meant when I heard a clank and a groan from the deck behind the sail. I turned around and was searching for the source of the noise with the night vision in the goggles. I had just spotted the small circular hatch cover standing open near the aft end of the port sponson when, whoosh, a small missile launched. I jumped halfway out of the sail, but at least I had not been blinded. I recovered and looked up as the surrounding seas and cloud ceiling above was lit up brightly by the bright white exhaust of the missile. Before it penetrated the clouds, it flared and then sputtered out. The small rocket casing at its rear detached and fell back towards the sea off to the port side of the boat. The upper stage of the missile continued to climb, but now with only a steady drone and the smaller blue flame of a jet-type engine. Soon that stage disappeared and entered the clouds above. I had just witnessed our boat launch a missile. Thanks for warning me, you blasted machine, I grumbled. Intense cardiovascular stimulation is good for your body, Joan. My beating heart slowed down a bit. The drone will remain loitering above the cloud level at altitude for over an hour, monitoring the enemy AI's transmissions. It will then land on the deck and be retrieved by the OMU unit using the starboard deck hatch. I will then process the data it has obtained. I stayed on the sail for another 10 minutes before heading below. While I passed through the workshop compartment, I paused at the fabrication area to look over the gear Naomi was producing. The main item I was eager to see complete was a new augmentation and camouflage suit. This was one of the items we wanted to test on Mauritius. It was intended to provide multiple types of camouflage as well as boost my strength and endurance. The suit was an all-black jumpsuit with a black face mask hood. When worn, the suit would mask my body's heat by absorbing and transferring the heat to a large block of paraffin phase change material in the backpack. There was also a large power capacitor to drive the thermal pumps. The suit was good for around two hours in the cool of the dark and a bit longer in the heat of the day. On top of the thermal camouflage, the black coloring was photoreactive and would change like a cuttlefish to mimic the colors and textures of anything in the nearby area. It could not do anything about shadows but Naomi had been instructing me during my yoga and Pilates sessions on certain forms to assume while standing or sitting to mask and disguise the shadows cast by my body. The final function of the suit was that it had a small amount of synthetic musculature woven into the suit. This would give me a bit of an endurance boost, but mainly compensated for the weight of the suit and the heavy mass of the thermal sink and the energy storage capacitor. Overall, we were hoping the suit would have enough power and thermal absorption to allow for two hours of operation. After that, it would have to be connected to a robust power source to both recharge the capacitor and cool and solidify the phase change paraffin heat sink. It seemed the face mask was done. It looked like a ski mask, but without any mouth, nose, or eye holes on the front. Inside, there were built-in goggles and a flat respirator that received cool, fresh air from a chest unit below and channeled the hotter exhaled air down and around the back of the mask and into the backpack. I did not put the headgear on as it needed the lower suit for power. I set the mask down and saw that the gloves and footgear were also completed. They were also black and looked like my other gloves and footgear, except these had thermal connections that interfaced with the suit. The gloves also were a bit thicker because they had a bit of the synthetic musculature to increase grip strength. It was after 22 o'clock when I finally returned to the salon. I saw Omu heading up to the starboard sponson in its deck hatch, which must mean that the high-altitude aerial drone must be due back. I debated on going up there to help or waiting here. I decided to risk getting wet from the chance that the deck hatch would get swamped and followed the little black unit up to the airlock chamber. There, I waited at the base of the deck hatch ladder as Omu climbed and opened the deck hatch. She got the hatch opened and climbed up onto the deck. A bit of seawater came in the hatch and I regretted not having my goggles with me. After a few minutes, I saw Omu lean down the open hatch and lower the aerial drone down to me. The drone was a streamlined shape about the size of a golf bag. I got it down to the deck and looked up in time to see Omu lowering a pair of wings, each about a meter long. The drone must have detached its wings to fit in the hatch. 
I got the wings and set them by the drone and waited in the red lit chamber for Omu to climb down and reseal the hatch. We then used a wall-mounted hose and nozzle to spray all the seawater off each other, the drone and the chamber interior. The drainage discharged into a scuttle in the floor to be pumped overboard. After everything was washed down, we left the starboard airlock and carried the drone over to the port sponson drone chamber. As I walked by the biodrone area, I noticed the two small creches with the jackal and the monkey were lit up with telltales, their contents being brought back to operating awareness. It was after 23 o'clock when I finished my shower. I asked Naomi if there was anything urgent to report from the drone or if it could wait till the morning. She said that the morning would be fine and wish me a good night. The next morning after my breakfast, I sat in my recliner with my coffee. Naomi dimmed the room and started the briefing by playing a video on the viewing screen. The view showed the drone emerging above the cloud cover and into the dark, star-filled black sky. After a moment to orientate itself, the drone turned towards the north and east. The dense cloud cover off towards the distant north horizon suddenly lit with a very bright flash. Was it lightning? It seemed much brighter. About a second or two later, another bright flash lit the clouds to the far north. Over the next six seconds, three more bright flashes occurred. I was about to ask what it was when a glowing speck of an object breached the clouds. The drone's camera zoomed in and I could make out a faint cylindrical object. It must have been a rocket of some sort. The video whited out and the drone quickly zoomed the view back and used a filter to decrease the glare. I could see the bustle of a shockwave now below the rapidly climbing rocket. The center of the bubble had a distinct lingering bluish purple glow that was quickly fading. The rocket was now far above that explosion and leaning to the east as its course was making a sweeping curve off to that horizon as it climbed. Another bright flash occurred at the base of the rocket. I watched as the vehicle formed a string of bright explosions as it headed away off to the northeast horizon. The image reminded me of a distant military plane dropping flares except they were much brighter and faded almost instantly. The show continued for another 20 seconds until the rocket was too far over the horizon. The flashes reflected in the air were still visible for another 10 seconds, although growing weaker fast. What you are seeing is an orbital launch vehicle, which was launched from the northern end of Madagascar over 900 kilometers to the north, Naomi explained. Was that some sort of Orion Drive rocket? I asked. Correct, Joan. From the sensor data received by the drone, the spectral emissions of the explosions indicate thrust was derived from some type of pure fusion detonations occurring at approximately a 1.42 seconds frequency. The video sped up and showed the starlit cloud cover as the drone loitered at altitude collecting signals and listening to the satellite transmissions to the area. Almost an hour later, the video slowed to normal speed. I saw off to the northeast, much further away, the bright pulses, which must have been another launch vehicle, light up the horizon in that direction. A second orbital launch was made from the eastern edge of the African continent. Analysis of both vehicles' launch trajectories indicate they are targeted on a point near the equator in a medium altitude orbit. As I watched the second rocket fly off towards the northeast, leaving behind God's own pearl necklace of fusion pulses, a new bright star appeared towards the equator from the west heading east. It was moving like a satellite, but much brighter. Is that the big satellite we saw from earlier in our journey? What is it? He asked, the large satellite appears to be the destination of both of the vehicles we observed launching last night. There is little information about the satellite currently being disseminated on the data net. I therefore conclude that it is a new construction intended to directly support the master artificial presence in some way. The brightness of the satellite indicates that it is a large structure. Also, as compared to the view of it from earlier in our journey, it appears to be growing in size rapidly. Hmm, the enemy AI is building something new. We'd have to keep an eye on it. From the data that the drone was able to intercept, it appears that there are periodic launches from various places in the African Equatorial Basin up to this new orbital construction site. There is limited data about what their cargoes were, but all nearby field bases were instructed to monitor the launches. The video soon ended with the drone descending into the cloud cover. Gradually, the haze cleared and the infrared beacons Nautilus had left flashing for the drone came into view. 
The beacons rapidly approached, and I could see Omu standing at the open starboard deck hatch. The video cut out as Omu reached for the now-landed drone. What were you able to learn about our next destination? I asked. Unfortunately, I detected far more enemy AI activity on both islands than I had expected. The transmitted data implied a massive biological effort underway on both Reunion and Mauritius Islands. From what I was able to intercept, I believe the biological work involves planting numerous food crops and the introduction of a new balanced ecosystem on both islands as a form of long-term test. I have to advise that we abandon our plans of landing on Mauritius. I frowned. I was really looking forward to getting off the boat for a few days. May I suggest an alternative? The machine said. A map image appeared on the wall screen. It showed the two islands and then highlighted a third slightly further to the east. This is Rodriguez. It is a small volcanic island approximately 560 kilometers east of Mauritius. It is approximately 18 kilometers long by five wide. The entire island is surrounded by coral reefs which should make for excellent and enjoyable diving. It is not too far off our course to Sri Lanka. How long until we get there, I asked, perking up. We will arrive off the island's northern shores in approximately four days, Joan. Well, I had some packing to do. I spent the next few days going over the gear Naomi had already created and thinking about what I wanted to add. I missed surf fishing and wanted to try a bit of that. A new drop pod was readied for Habu to take ashore once our bio scouts had had a look around. We started the other two bio drones decanting and would be sending all four out on scouting missions. In the afternoon, I tried out the camouflage and augment suit. It was comfortable and its synthetic musculature made its bulk unnoticeable when moving around in it. The only issue was I would sometimes bang the power and heat sink backpack on doorways and hatches. It was a good thing that Naomi had added a decent amount of armor and cushioning around the vulnerable points. When I had the headset on, I was limited to artificial views in the embedded goggles, but they were crystal clear. My sense of smell was a bit muted as the air I breathed was filtered. I looked forward to trying it on the beach in the hills of the island. It went in the drop pod with the rest of the camping supplies. Omu and my chores had increased to include prepping the four biodromes. The jackal and the monkey had been thawed for a few days now and had even roamed the ship a few times getting their muscles ready. The AI had made small booties for the jackal's paws that allowed it to run on the magic treadmill. The monkey just went climbing around the catwalks in the workroom. It could really move with its prehensile tail aiding its climbing. I had to admit it was nice to not have to worry about toilet training them as they returned to the starboard sponson and their workbench to excrete waste as needed. After seeing them move about for a few hours, I decided to name them. The jackal was easy and it got stuck with Jake. Jake looked like a small version of the coyotes, which had been common around my old acreage. His weight was 11 kilograms, and he was 65 centimeters long. I watched as the bio drone practiced jumping in the large workroom. It had no problem jumping the one and a half meters up to the catwalk from halfway across the room. He looked to be able to trot all day long, just like a coyote. I debated on the monkey a bit longer before settling on Georgia. The reason I hesitated is that in its drone state on board the ship, it had absolutely no curiosity. But the scouting George would be doing on the island would be a fine substitute for curiosity. George was a male and was around 50 centimeters from head to its feet. Its tail was also that long. He was created to be similar to the species of monkey called a tok macaque, which was native to Sri Lanka. But this one, was modified to have a stronger prehensile tail, and Naomi did not think any other AIs would notice. The other two biodrones were now revived, enough to be sitting up in the biodrone workroom, slowly becoming more active. When I checked, Otto and Jonathan were both slowly doing their Tai Chi routine. I left them to their business. I went to bed that night excited that the next day we would be reaching our destination. Naomi had surfaced the boat last night and scanned the airwaves and had detected nothing from Rodriguez Island. She had also accessed the satellite feeds and had a rough forecast of the expected weather in the area for the next few days, which would be near perfect vacation weather. I woke the next mornings feeling a bit horny. I began to masturbate. Recently, I had begun to enjoy the sensation of my left hand's fingers in my opening 
while I rubbed my clitoris with my right. The combination soon brought me to orgasm, and I laid there a bit basking in the glow and catching my breath. When I finally arose and went to open my burst door on the way to the head, I was surprised to see Omu standing outside with its ear cupped towards the door. Its other hand was rubbing its weak imitation of a breast. The unit jumped back, startled when I caught it being a voyeur. Excuse me, I quietly said as I moved around the unit and into the head. I was proud of myself. I had instantly recognized how absurd it was for the unit to be listening in on my jilling session when the AI presence ran the whole ship and already saw and heard everything I had done in my birth. I was again being punked, but I hoped my reaction to the attempt had reversed the punk and was now causing a great deal of confusion in the AI circuits. As I showered, I just rolled my eyes and smiled at the memory of the sight of the little unit standing there. I wondered if I would find it laying in my bunk when I returned, smoking a fake cigarette and holding a pair of my underwear up to its fake nose. Quite the intelligence I was dealing with. I wondered how it came up with the gags. Had it scoured old prank videos, or was it intuitive enough to design them on the fly based upon my predicted reactions? All I knew was that I had a minor victory to and I was going to bask in it. After lunch, I felt the boat slow. Naomi relayed that we had reached our destination point off of the northeast corner of Rodriguez Island. The reef was closer to the shore on this side of the island, and with it, the deeper water Nautilus would need to remain undetected. Omu and I deployed Jonathan to the surface using an aquatic drone and a surface delivery cylinder. We watched as Jonathan took to the air via the drone's camera. Next, we prepped the mini-sub. I was going to run the mini-sub through the reef and into the shallow waters near the beach. Otto would then be released there to swim the rest of the way to shore. I donned my underwater suit with the breathing gear and entered the mini-sub. Omu closed and sealed the hatch behind me and piloted the mini-sub away from the Nautilus's narrow wet bay. The water here was as clear as the water was back on the island off of the Brazilian coast, so the visibility was great once we climbed to within five meters of the surface. Soon I had steered the mini-sub to a gap in the reef wide and deep enough to allow the mini-sub's passage. I kept the mini-sub as deep as I could in the shallow waters of the lagoon and skimmed along the bottom. The fish and aquatic life were amazing near the reef and in the lagoon. I looked forward to doing plenty of diving soon if the island scouted as safe. I was able to get the sub to within a few hundred meters of the shore when I felt that I was becoming too shallow. I slowly allowed the mini sub to drop to the bottom and prepared to flood the small vessel. Otto came alive and hopped around the sub's interior watching out the thick clear front bubble. As the water filled the sub to the hatch, I equalized pressure and opened the upper hatch. The otter shot out the small hatchway and headed to the surface for a quick breath of air. I popped my head out the hatch and looked around in all directions. I did not see any sharks or other large predator fish, so I ducked back into the cabin below and returned with a small canister of nutrient fluid for Otto. He swam circles around the sub, waiting for me, until I returned and then grabbed the canister in his mouth and headed to shore. The food in the canister would allow him to stay ashore tonight and refuel on his own. This would give him the rest of today and all night to continue to scout this side of the island. I'd return in the morning to pick him up back at Nautilus that evening. We used an aquatic drone to retrieve Jonathan in its tube from the surface. Naomi interfaced with the bird and downloaded the video and data retrieved during the day's mission. While that was happening, Omu and I prepared the Jackal Bio Drone for its mission to the island. Jake was tucked into a larger transport cylinder and launched out into the water using the biodrone tube launcher. In addition to the prone jackal, the launch cylinder contained a small oxygenator and carbon dioxide scrubber, which would allow the jackal to survive in the tube for over an hour. Once the cylinder was free of Nautilus, a larger aquatic drone linked up and began to propel the cylinder to the beach just below the surface. The shallow joined objects left a small visible ripple wake which should be undetected in the darkness. The trip to the beach area would last half an hour, and once it got there, Jake would emerge from the cylinder and swim to shore and begin prowling around the island in the darkness, relying on his augmented vision. All that remained now was to wait. In the morning, we would redeploy Jonathan to continue scouting. I would go pick up Otto in the mini-sub and bring him back to have his mission information downloaded back into Naomi. 
If all went well, we would plan on flying in with Habu tomorrow night and setting up camp in an area cleared by Otto. I showered and went to bed. I would be up an hour before dawn so that I would be near the beach in the mini-sub around dawn.